Hello and welcome to the Sound on Sound podcast channel about electronic music and all things synth. I'm Rob Pericelli and in this episode I talk to musician Don Lewis and director Ned Augustenborg about The Ballad of Don Lewis, their new documentary movie on Don's amazing story in the world of music. From the creation of the live electronic orchestra, a collection of synthesizers, organs and drum machines that Don built himself and which both predated and inspired MIDI connectivity, to his struggles with the musicians' union that wanted to stop him from performing live. Don's story, which has been meticulously told by writer and director Ned, is both fascinating and inspirational, and so I began by asking Don how it felt to have a movie made about his life. There are no words to, <laughs> to describe this. Um, it, this is like, you know, a dream I never had. Um, uh, you know, I, I never thought that my life would be, I hope it would be interesting for me and my family and maybe in my community, but I never thought it would reach to this, le- this level of um, engagement. And thanks to Ned, um, who's become my my little brother, he you have to understand that he's <laughs> six feet seven, and I'm I'm barely five feet seven, and I call him my little brother. <laughs> um, but he has taken uh, take taken his life the last fifteen sixteen years of his life to tell this story. The story's not um, the film's not that long, but. <laughs> 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 but he's managed to um to make a very wonderful wonderful portrayal of of the incidences uh the 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 people that have met the people that i i feel like i stand on the shoulders of um who have helped me uh throughout this whole this whole world of music and um he has done a brilliant job um the reviews that are coming back even right now from Amazon and so forth are five stars, and uh, the reviews are just off the wall. I, I'm, and I'm I'm just uh, grateful and humbled at the same time to to be receiving the, this kind of um, recognition because I think it's it's a I hope that this is a a wonderful way to inspire people to understand that. The reason we're here is to create, be co-creators, and when we and we can re- when we recognize that in any one of us, it just builds the whole world up. Ned, what was the catalyst? What what was the moment you thought I need to make a film about the life of Don Lewis? It came very early on. It actually, I believe it was uh, the first day I met Don it was a, a three camera shoot that I'd set up of a concert with the Leo, the Live Electronic Orchestra, at the Museum of Making Music, funded by NAM. And uh, at that point, I just was thinking it'd be maybe thirty seconds of maybe a larger documentary because I've always loved synthesizers. Uh, uh, just something I was fascinated with. So, I, well, this guy looks pretty cool. But it was a, either I think it was the next day uh, I interviewed Don, and you know the interview process is a pretty intimate process. It's a kind of a bizarre process because it's sort of unnatural in a way as we participate at this very moment. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, it wasn't really till after the interview I sat down with Don for about forty five minutes, and it was like kindred spirits. So I just said. To myself, th- this this is it. This is the personification of a subject that I have a a real strong um, uh, appeal, you know, attraction to, and uh, and then from there it sort of built. You know, there were elements that I knew I needed to have a successful documentary completed, but that was a matter of Don and Julie, his wife Julie. Um, 
you know, gaining the trust factor where they're willing to tell me about certain aspects of their life that they otherwise maybe didn't feel comfortable talking about. So it was very early on, but then built from there. Yeah. Don, why create Leo? What was the the impetus behind the creation of this this amazing piece of equipment? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> You know, when when I created Leo, it was really after accumulating so many instruments uh, and trying to play them on stage, and it was so inconvenient. Um, it was not easy. Uh, every uh, in the early days, of course, you know, the synthesizers, key, the keyboards for them only played one note. Uh, they were monophonic, and um, so. Um, trying to make a chord you have to have three four keyboards almost to make a four note chord and um and that got kind of unwieldy so um i decided um back in 1974 i sat down with my my uh <laughs> t-square my triangle and my drawing board and i and i drew some plans pr preliminary plans and that's you know that's one of the things that that happens when you write things down or then you have a goal you have something to look at and it took 3 years later before it actually became uh, a reality but the whole idea was um to set this off uh after i heard uh Walter Carlos Wendy Carlos now uh was switched on Bach and i was a big fan of of Bach, uh, I love that music. And then when I heard these these sounds coming from what I would normally have called in the Honeywell uh, days when I was working as a electronic <laughs> technician at Honeywell, I would have called that a you know function generator <laughs> because it had all the waveforms there. But here you got this function generator that that responded to the pitches that you needed to make a chord or to make a sound. And then you had filters and so forth. So when I heard what she had done, it just blew my mind. And then I found out it took two years to, to do this in a studio, particularly sitting down and doing line by line. And I said, no, I can't, I, I can't wait that long. I may not live that long. I, I need to do this real time, live. And so I started pursuing that. It was in 1972, I think it was right before uh, the NAMM show there, um, I was introduced to the ARP company, uh, Alan R. Perlman's uh, company, and um, Paul Pittman, who was um, uh, had found a new job. Uh, he used to work with Hammond, and he had found a new job as being the uh, national <laughs> sales manager for ARP, and he pulled me on board. And when I got a hold of the 2600 and uh, the, the soloist at that time, and I put it in combination with uh, Concord Hammond at that point for that uh, 72 uh, NAM show in Chicago, and then it started to make sense. It started to make sense. And then I just kept building on top of that, building on top of that until I decided oh, I got to take all these, these little parts and put them together in a, in a package that I can play. Do you have an aversion to playing in a band? Was was that part of it? Did, or you, did you like the control that it gave you? Well, you know, really, except for for um, for high school, that was the only time I had ever played in a band. Um, <laughs> and and uh, I, you know, I played instrumentally with with choirs, you know, as as a keyboard uh, accompaniment, um, and and and. And uh, the organ, you know, being raised on the organ, the organ is sort of, you know, self-sustaining. I mean, it can do it can do some stuff all by itself. So when I started professionally playing, the organ was the first um, my first instrument, and it wasn't that I had an aversion, but in the places I was playing, you couldn't put a band in there. <laughs> I was playing in little, you know, uh, restaurants and and so forth, and so I just tried to, uh, how can I say, make the most efficient use of the space that I had. And that ended up being solo. But uh, on top of that, I, I've i appeared with uh, symphony orchestra as, as a so soloist. Um, and so, 
it's not that I haven't played with a band. I like playing with, with guys when we get together um, and, and jam, and I love that. Uh, we had a, an experience uh, playing, playing with a drummer in, at Carnegie Hall. That was the first time I think I had a drummer, a live drummer. Every, all, everything else before that was rhythm units. And, um, and that was a, a real, um, real wonderful um, collaboration. The process of making a documentary, as, as I've spoken to other people who have done that job, it, it's a very challenging process in assembling all of the, the characters and getting those interviews and also, you know, creating a story arc that you can hang all of these wonderful events on to make sense to the viewer, to make it engaging. What, what, what were some of the big challenges that you faced making this particular film? Well, about every challenge that the mind could imagine. Um, and a lot, a, lot, a lot of it had to do with my lofty goals. I mean, if you look at the traditional uh, music documentary, quote, unquote, you know, it's standard form. It's, you know, a bass player, guitar player, in junior high or high school, they get together. They talk some kid down the street into playing drums. They got themselves a little high school rock band, uh, find an agent, have a hit. Uh, all of a sudden, they got some playtime on the radio. And now it's time to get a drug habit, maybe an alcoholic in there somewhere and one of them has sex with his other's girlfriend and before you know it the band breaks up and then 20 years later they have a reunion concert and final credits okay so this this obviously was not that the a subset of, of that. <laughs> far from it um so, but then the subset of that, which you've, we've seen more and more of, thank God, because it's a wonderful subject, I'd be the first to say that, is, uh, I'll call it electronic music documentaries that concentrate on a specific instrument designed by a specific person, or maybe even a company. And um, all of those tended to have certain limitations, and what was great about Don is he was the personification of so many instruments and so many of the achievements that a lot of people don't necessarily relate to electronic music or synthesizers. So that, that was a challenge there. And right off the top, so having said that, I, I wanted to do something that wasn't just for a, a synthesizer, synthesizer enthusiast or even just a, a person who loves popular music. I wanted something that was for the masses, which of course everyone tells you you can't do it, that's stupid, that's a bad marketing strategy, you gotta come up with your demo market. But, but I felt that Don's story was universal from the very beginning. So the biggest issue I had having committed to that is how do I make this movie about a guy who made so many technological advancements or responsible for them? How do I work around terms like live electronic orchestra, subtractive synthesis, uh, frequency modulated synthesis, musical instrument digital interface? And how do you not turn off your normal viewer with those types of you know terms? And you know I had so many great people in the film, seventeen in all, that were hip to that drive. You know, before I interviewed them, I told them, look, I want everyone to understand this. So I'm trying to get, I want it to be educational without being dry. And I don't want people to feel stupid because they don't know about the technology behind all these achievements. And, and God, you know, when you're dealing with talented, smart people, that, it, it, that makes the interview process so much better. So that was really one of the biggest highlights of the film is every time Julie and Don book somebody, Julie mostly, it just got better and better. I mean, you're talking to people like Dr. John Chowney and Gary Leuenberger, and it just the list goes, and, Doc, you know, and Mr. Kakahashi. You know, you just feel, like I, I've said this before, is, you know, there's always a part of your ego as a producer, especially documentaries, where you think, come on, we're going to get this done, you know? And part of me said, well, if it never gets done, this has been such a great experience for me, Don and Julie, just to bring all these wonderful people together that hadn't seen each other in years. Just to do the mm -hmm. interview was just a, a, a fulfilling experience in and of itself. Yeah, there, there did seem to be a lot of love yeah. in in the room, so to speak, <laughs> yeah. between all, all of the people involved. You know, there's a huge a huge amount of respect 
for everyone amongst everyone it was it was very you know that, that really struck me the film don depicts your life both from a technological perspective and also a personal perspective and i just wanted to kind of focus on that just for a moment because it depicts your struggle against the musicians unions of the time and also the you know the underlying cultural tones that were going on in various aspects of of uh, america at the time you came up against so many barriers but you blazed a trail and here you are today being celebrated you know as you as you should be do you, do you feel vindicated by that well i don't know if vindication is something that i was looking for but i feel satisfied uh with the fact that um musicians after after the court case we won the court case were basically given the okay mm -hmm. that they would not be banned from using synthesizers as a part of their of their uh, musical expression uh the other thing is that i i wanted um in that court case i just wanted this information to be public and that was a uh, public record for for the courts we didn't know how it was actually going to turn out but we wanted the vindication was just getting this information out so people could look at it for what it was worth back then because we didn't know what was going to happen it's five days in the courtroom and um um uh, i think it was the same the same judge that shut down uh, napster remember when right. okay that was Judge Patel, Marilyn Patel, um, and she was the uh, she was presiding over that over that um, session, and and uh, I just felt like when that was over, I had won something for all the people, all the bands that I was not in. <laughs> <laughs> I won a place for them uh, to yeah. be a part uh, and not feel. Um, uh, like uh, the tools that they wanted to new, to use were were uh, taken away from them. In my case, it was not the tool we had. We still had Leo, but we couldn't perform. We couldn't perform with Leo, and yeah. and that was not only in the Bay Area, but it went national. Um, sure. And uh, so, um, I just want uh, everyone to know that. Uh, I'm I'm fine. I was I was fine then. It reminds me of an old hymn that it is well with my soul. Uh yeah. that 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 I felt. Um and both Julie and I went through. But for us, it was also um a way to understand that there are more ways to make a living. And I I had um thank God I had this knowledge of sound design and electronics and so forth. Uh, that I could fall back on during the days that I couldn't perform uh, out as a musician in the in the ways that I had done before, and um, and and so so I got to hone my my uh, skills even more during that period of time. It was a very I had a lot of growth, and then and then I met people like Alan Kay, who is actually residing in London right now. Right. Um, and uh, his wife Bonnie, who's the Sherlock Holmes novelist now, yes, uh, yes. I met people like that uh, who gave me um, even more to do with music, and that's when we uh, was involved with the Vivarium um, project that Alan was over, and uh, in L.A. with the public schools, where we were bringing. Uh, the DX7, the QX1, the TX816 into a school, elementary school, and teaching kids how to use this equipment. This was back in the 80s. <laughs> Amazing. Hold on, hold on, just a little while long. I said, hold on, hold on, just a little while long. I said, hold on, hold on, just a little while longer. Everything's going to be all right. Everything. Everything. 
coming back to the, the technological side of things, I've got a couple yeah. of questions that relate to that. So first of all, if we look at Leo, Leo is a combination of, at its heart, is is a Hammond organ. And to the left and the right, you have a variety of analog synthesizers. Mm-hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, we've got some rolling gear on, on your left. And on the right, we've got the, uh, the Oberheim stuff. And there's some ARP stuff in there right, as well. Right, so it's predominantly right. very old technology. Uh, uh, two questions. First of all, why those particular instruments? What, what was special about those? And, and secondly, have you ever considered swapping them for other things, you know, making it a modular kind of thing? You know, um, I I did with what I could do, whatever whatever it was, I, I could get my hands on. Um, sure. And and then um, one of the things I think that was so interesting about that process, and I find it more more difficult the more keyboards I have. Uh, I was limited, but yet creativity wise, it was unlimited um, because I. I, I would think of things um, to do with that one or two or three instruments that, you know, 14 instruments uh, would be confusing. Uh, I used to tell Mr. Kakahashi, I says, you know, when everybody started coming out with, oh, my God, you got a thousand sounds on here and you got this. I says, I don't need a thousand sounds. I says, I may need 10 basic sounds but give me a thousand ways to manipulate it and so that's what that that the foundation of of uh, leo was to take those uh uh technologies that were available uh, available to me uh the oberheims uh i love the sound of the oberheims uh, i love the sound of the art but never did you ever hear the two of them being played together in an ensemble as such um because um, most bands were not instrumental bands. Um, they were vocal bands for, for the most part. I mean, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer were probably the exception to that. Um, yeah. And um, so, so uh, and then having the Roland equipment, and then the vocoder, we didn't really talk too much about the vocoder uh, at all in the, in the, in the, um, in the movie, but uh, Man, that was like having a gospel choir and no, and not having to buy robes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Leo was a way uh, was a uh, 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 a catalyst for me to take my musical experiences that I had uh, from my early beginnings uh, in the church and working with choirs and loving orchestral music, uh, the symphony as well, and loving jazz and all of those things combined and and taking that instrument through um, its paces. Um, and, you know, I lived with, with Leo a long time. I, 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 when I played at night, normally I would go to the Hungry Tiger during the daytime because I always had to do some repairs on it. <laughs> and while I was there, I would do some uh, rehearsing and um so i lived with it uh for five years at, at the hungry tiger and it was it was quite a a wonderful trip it was a wonderful trip um uh, back in those days uh, of course dancing was was a big which you know disco and of course tr808 hey <laughs> We can make some t- we can make some yeah. disco out of that. Boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> but um, taking those, um, you know, just thinking about um, the instruments that were uh, are now, now iconic, and I had f- almost first dibs <laughs> on on using them, um, and and not only using them, but helping um, and giving and consulting with Roland. Uh, to build them, uh, uh, Kakahashi and Kikomoto, who, who was the guy with the TR-808, uh, and getting to know those guys. So those, those guys were my family. Yeah, uh, it was it was more than just building instrument; it was building relationships. And and to me, uh, I find that a very comforting um, and a humbling aspect. Yeah. I, getting to know those people uh, uh, was just. Uh, and 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 Alan uh, Perlman, I got to know him when I first joined uh, ARP, and um, even knew the president of of Hammond, Dave Kuttner at the time, 
and Jack Rittberger, who brought me into Hammond uh, sure. during the during those. Uh, so it was really about a people thing, and I think we all understand that uh, mm. uh, traveling in cir- uh, certain circles, um, but having something to to share and want and willing to to be there to share and uh, uh, to see what happens, giving you know people some inspiration <laughs> yeah because uh, i get fired well, i got fired up about the uh the ace tone in the very beginning when i met mr kagahashi i says every time i want to make a new rhythm i have to take my soldering iron and go inside and change <laughs> all the all the secretary and and i says i need i need programmable li- rhythm and he would look at me and says, oh, wait a little while. <laughs> <laughs> so <Really>. expensive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so have you ever been tempted to replace Leo with the modern technology of today, software? Have you ever considered building a software Leo? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm sitting here looking at... Um, in, in my studio, um, I, I, and, and you'll see if there's some titles on <laughs> some of the <laughs> files here. It says Leo Two, <laughs> Leo Number Two. Sure. Okay. Uh, but, but they don't have, they don't have the personality. I cannot find that personality in the digital world that I had in the analog world. Uh, the, the unwieldiness of analog the drifting oscillators the filters that crackle once in a while that gives you a sound oh i want that sound again <laughs> mm, sure. um uh, they made things too predictable in fact okay. um uh, especially when the digital stuff started coming out and everybody wanted to make everything perfect because the the analog was not perfect And then we found out that we like the imperfection better than we like the perfection. So then we started detuning things to get make a fatter sound. It still never really got that analog sound, but uh, they're still working on that. They call it uh, (laughs) audio audio. uh, What is what is it? Uh, Physical modeling for for audio uh, to get it from analog (laughs) from digital to analog to make it sound more analog. It would be nice to have a backup <laughs> uh, in case Leo once in a while uh, has its own agenda. It may, you know there may be parts of it that need a little tension. It's like it's like the early um, and I, I I may get cut off when I say this the early Jaguars that you had to spend a lot of time <laughs> working on the motor. <laughs> yeah. I think the synthesizer world has a lot in common, so particularly the vintage yeah. synthesizer with vintage automobiles. Yes, exactly. it really does. Yeah, it really does. But there's a personality um, that um, I think it's almost the fact that you could see the um, not the uniformity of the parts that went inside. There were tolerances on 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 the. <laughs> On the actual value of a resistor and capacitors and all that, and so you had all these variables already built into the instrument, so you know it's not going to be that stable. Um, but um, and and now going in and repairing, I, I've been going and restoring the pro soloist that's inside the, of Leo, and I had a couple of ICs that went bonkers and it took me weeks to find out which one it was. Um, and, but going in and then finally getting it to work <clears throat> and you say, oh my gosh, this is really great. Um, because that sound, it was the sound that, that you were after that analog sound. I was struck by the, the caliber of guests, uh, that, you know, contributors that you had like Kakahashi San and, and I, am I right in understanding that this was probably his last or one of his last kind of appearances before his untimely passing. I think, is. from a formal sense, I think there might have been a couple of one-offs for some some quick blogs or something. But certainly, in a formal sense, it was, yeah, yeah. But you managed to you know to pull together some some really interesting people from from Don's life, 
And you mentioned earlier, you alluded to the fact that uh, Don's wife, Julie, um, helped in, in kind of getting that. What, was that a difficult process to, to collate these people and to get, the, get their input? No, it was the easiest part of the whole film, as a matter of fact. It was just a matter of scheduling it. And in a lot of cases, these folks, have, like all of us, have gotten a bit older. So their time wasn't as, uh, I'm not going to say not as valuable, but I mean, their schedules weren't as taxing as they once were. And of course, everyone wants, is happy to provide time for Don, you know. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, one of the things I didn't mention earlier when you were asking about the film, but it, it, it made me think of it when Don's talking about MIDI. And in its most simplistic form, I think one of the guiding lights I had, and Don and I talked about this at length, is this film is really about connectivity, you know, and, and MIDI is sort of a metaphor for really life. You know, you've got all these yeah. connections that happen through MIDI, but, you know, Don's life certainly wouldn't have been as enriched as it is without all of these people to connect to. And I think, you know, if younger people are watching this film, it'd be great if they got inspired to be involved in music and it's specifically synthesizers. But more than anything, I want them to understand the importance of connecting with other human beings. I mean, what are the odds of Don, this kid who grew up, you know, in the projects, you know, post-World War II or really, uh, you know, Dayton, Ohio, end up being lifelong friends with this guy who's from post-World War II Japan who had yeah. terrible physical problems as a kid and overcame them, and they became two of the most important people in each other's lives, you know? Um, yeah. I, I mean, that's just, you, know, you can't even come up with the odds. So that's where the, I think the connectivity is a real strong um, way to describe this and very simple way to describe the film. In terms of the, the production of the movie, I kind of get the impression that it's a very, you have a very minimalist crew, I guess. I'd say so, yeah. <laughs> Well, when you're when you're going to a, do a film and probably any other venture, you you got two things you need. You need time. You need money. Uh, I had a bit more time than I had money, so that meant I could do a lot of things that I otherwise wasn't expecting to do. So I produced it, directed, I cut it. I. I cut everything. I had to learn new skills. Um, and even the animations, really, um, those animations that you're seeing in the film, because I wanted to have whatever I thought was sort of a nice comedic break in, in the rest of the film. Um, those are really supposed to be samples for more professional and experienced L.A. animators. But, you know, I had a couple come in and I got the same thing. It's like, well, it looks like it's done to me. And, you know, what do you want me to do? And then they found out that I did it all, the animations on Photoshop. And with Adobe Premiere Pro, they, they got mad at me. They said, that's not what that software is designed to do. It's not designed to do <laughs> animation. Because they were offended. And I said, well, I don't know how to use the other stuff. So I just, I don't know. And I said, I, I said, give me some better ideas. And they never did. So I just kept it, you know, and, and, and announced it. So, so in a way, there's, there's this, this kind of mirroring of Don's life that, you know, you're <laughs> yeah. using the tools that you have. You're right. And the limitations make you yeah. ever so much more creative. Absolutely yes. correct. Exactly. Exactly the same thing. We've talked about that, too. But there's a strong parallel. You, you, you do what you can with what you have. And I like limitations, personally. Because you know what? It sort of gives me a timeline, and it's sort of this sort of vague, in a way, uh, deadline. It's like you can only do so much with this limited type of software or tools, and you're done with it. And uh, I kind of like that. Plus, this part of me is just too lazy to learn more software, and I didn't have the time to learn any more software. I already learned far more software than I wanted to do in this film. You know, uh, Not that I don't enjoy the process, but the problem when you're learning software and creating a, a, a project or a piece of art is... You know, you're always questioning yourself. Do you, should I spend more time researching this so I know more features? Or should I just delve into my sort of creative habits of wanting to get this down and see if it works? And I, I, kinda, I lean toward the latter. I, I come up with an idea and a, you know, a, a juxtaposition of concepts and uh, you know, a, a, a shot piece aligned to another shot piece, and I want to see if it works right away. And, and when it came to the real linkage of the whole story... I had six or seven major accomplishments that had to be told about Don, you know. And you were asking me earlier, one of the challenges, one of the big challenges of the film, too, is that Don is not a household name, you know. And it's not like I'm doing something on Jimi Hendrix for the 30th time or uh, a David Bowie. And the other thing is that Don's alive. Most documentaries are done on dead people, to be quite frank, you know. So that that kind of offers a... Hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep going. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, well, I know that Julie, under her breath the whole time over the course of these years, is saying, I hope he does this before my husband dies or before I die. And I would say, I hope I do it before I die. You know, I'm the key guy here. But I'm the one that needs to live. But anyway, there were these sort of major accomplishments and falling back on my news background, not knowing what the final arc's going to be. Because, like with narrative film, you've got your blueprint, you've spent your time with the script, and now you can dump money into the script. This is just the opposite. You're dumping money and time into something that you don't even know which, where it's going, actually, you know? And so um, I would just say, okay, let me do a seven or eight minute video on frequency modulated synthesis and how Don was involved in this. And I'm going to do another six or seven minutes on, you know, the TR-808. And without a lot of uh, thought as to where it's going to be placed in the final, the you know, arc, so to speak. Um, and then I figured they'd take care of themselves. And it did. It worked out because that was a very productive way, fortunately, that I luckily came up with to you know, expedite the process as much as I could. The one thing I'm, I'm always conscious of with these films is that they, they do have... Uh, a limited market if you pitch them to synthesizer geeks so what what steps have you taken to to pitch this to uh to organizations distributors to to get them to take this this story which is a very human story but also you know deeply rooted in technology how have, have you gone around pitching that? Well, it has, I haven't been doing the pitching of the, per, the, the first, actually, I shouldn't say that. Our first pitch was to find an agent. You know, you got to find a sales agent that has as much uh, enthusiasm for the film as you do. And we found one in L.A., Mark Bruder. He's, he's great. I mean, he just immediately loved this story. And it's strange how I even found him. I, you know, I have a, a long background in sports directing and producing live event. And I found Mark through a guy who was a satellite guy for me when I was doing ESPN shoots. And he said, I grew up in Hollywood with this guy who's now a sales agent and boom, I mean, who'd ever think, right? But he is totally sold on it and he just loves Don and Julie. So we were about ready to close some fairly big deals. You know, I'm still looking at HBO, Showtime, those types of people. No big names have said no yet they just say we love this story give us a second well we gave them a few seconds and the pandemic hit and it's kind of like you know the brakes went on with a lot of things so in the meantime what's turned out to be a very 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 um pleasant surprise has been dvds you know who would have thunk you know everybody said dvds were dead a few years ago and People are buying the DVD, so we're lucky to have. Uh, I mean, just just yesterday, I found out Barnes and Noble and Amazon Prime are distributing it through their DVD, you know, lines of, of distribution, um, as well as a, a, a American American movie. Cla- uh, no, Turner. Uh, Turner, Turner Classic Movies. Classic. And I don't yes. even know they had a division like that. And then, of course, we've we've got Target and those others. So um, the uh, the distributor of the DVDs has had no problem getting these people to carry this film. So, um, and then we're, I haven't seen the numbers yet on VOD, but you know, it's available to 80 million households that subscribe to cable. That market's dying out as well, but I think DVDs are coming back. Um, and I don't know the numbers on that so far, but I'm getting calls from friends that said, Hey, I watched it on TV. They live in New York. You know, they live in Houston. They live in San Francisco, Portland. So it, we'll have to see. But essentially, this is all in theory a big build up to, uh, you know, a larger venue. So, and, and do you hope to maybe have a, a theatrical release of this? Well, well, you know, it, it, it's almost screaming for it. But this is really a film because we did so many test screenings. And I, 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 uh, te- we did test screenings on, on two different rough cuts because I'm big on that. As much as I hate to be in an audience watching my own film, um, like I've said before, I'm cowering in the back corner with my head between my legs, not wanting to be there. But, uh, you know, I still learn a lot from the live audience. And it, it, it really is a movie that needs to be seen in what they call, you know, the four wall experience now, because people are obliged to stay there and really take the movie in because it isn't an easy viewing film. I think you'll agree with that. It's, you got to kind of stay on your toes a little bit. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, and so uh, to answer your question, I would like to get something going theatrically. I don't know how successful I'll be, but that will complement the DVDs being out there. And we certainly have to go to certain markets in Japan. We need to have a a couple screenings in Los Angeles and San Francisco. So, yes, that's going to happen. How 
how formalized that becomes in terms of a long-term distribution through theaters, I don't know yet. But we certainly have at least a dozen uh, four-wall screenings that we have to take care of. Yeah. So, yeah. And I'd love to come to London, actually, yeah, and and get a theater there and have a showing. That would be wonderful. I'm going to go to Ireland and do it. I know that. So, um, so yeah. To come back to you, Don, um, one of the, the central stories within the film is uh, the development of MIDI and, and your inspiration behind that, you know, what you were doing with Leo and how that inspired um, oh, okay. uh, Roland and so on. So here we are, 2020, MIDI 2.0 <laughs> has just just been ratified. Yes. Uh, some four, you know, 35 odd years after the the dawn of MIDI. I was, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on the on how solid that that protocol has become, and and how you feel it represented what you were trying to do. Has it kind of surpassed your expectations, maybe? Well, I I, I look at Leo um, and doing hard wire, <laughs> so to speak, uh, of each note. Um, controlling each one of the oscillators and and the gates and so forth that happen. Um, and one of the things that happened with Leo um, that uh, is sort of pedestrian, but it is a um, um, is the control of the volume. And I do that with an expression pedal, but the expression pedal uh, was controlling eight different channels. And each channel could have its own dynamic curve. This was unheard of back in those days. Uh, that you could actually have certain, as you increase the, the volume, certain, certain uh, channels would increase more than others. So if you had a solo going on, you raise it up and the others would come up a little, but that solo voice would really be... Down. And that was done with, with the expression pedal. Um, those were, those were things that, that really, um, facilitated me, um, um, wanting to, 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 to see how expressive this instrument could be. And when Kakehashi would come to the Hungry Tiger with his engineers, um, they, when they saw Leo, I think they, they, they looked and they said, oh my God, here's Oberheim and here's arp and here's hammond and here's roland all operating from the same console uh, for the most part and that that was the seed uh that was put in mr k's mind uh that this was not just the roland interconnect because he had done that with some of his instruments but he said we need to come up with this protocol that that's open source. In fact, he 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 he's, he wanted to be open source so it would equalize for ev- for everyone who wanted to enter. And when I when I saw the results of that, I really didn't know. In fact, he never really told me until much later on. And it might have been when when. When Ned went to Japan, when we went to Japan to to uh, interview him, did that cat come out of the bag like that? Because I never asked him directly. Um, and Ned asked him questions that I probably never would have thought of. And I sat there and I went, wow. Ad- this is- Admit it, Don, you were crying. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. 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 You got to understand. You have to understand, Ned really didn't want us in the room normally when he was doing an interview. He would always have someone uh, handling the audio. And uh, the audio guy, Bill, before uh, he, we went to Japan. Yeah, he, he got a job with the reality show and bailed on me two days before the trip. Yeah. Yeah. And so I ended up being the guy holding the microphone, <laughs> the boom. And so I had an overqualified audio guy, that's for sure. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been on the end of the boom like that. And and when and when I uh was listening to the answers that my dear friend had known since nineteen sixty nine, uh never spoke to me in that way. 
Uh, yeah, it was. I, I, there were times when I thought I was going to drop the microphone because I I was so emotional to to know that that we had affected each other's lives in the in that manner. And I, I'll tell you, um, uh, you, you know, you've really lived a life when when you can hear your friends. Um, it, it's it's one thing to do it when you're uh, you know in a casket or something. And, and you can't do it very well there, but when, but when when people are giving uh, giving um, an account of your relationship, it, it just makes you. Um, I, I don't know. It, it's just it's just very humbling, and it's um, a wonderful way to think that you have made a difference in someone else's life, and they made a difference in you. And so with, this has always been this, you know, uh, yin and yang kind of, you, you needed both both sides. You need a receiver. It's just like MIDI, <laughs> in and out. <laughs> of course, MIDI only did it with, they had to have two cables. <laughs> 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 um, but, but it was that way. And um, to know that this, this instrument and the concept was um, was the inspiration for Mitty, and for him, for Kagehashi, for Taro Sana, we Taro is his nickname, and um, he for the first time and the only time got the four manufacturers uh, in in Japan to cooperate, and only one manufacturer in in the United States, Dave Smith, sequential circuits. Um, joined with that, and they did it in less than a year. A protocol, it's remarkable. It's remarkable. It is. It's a remarkable achievement that has lasted so long as well. Yeah. As much as people, as many people, you know, the technocrats get in there and they say, well, it doesn't do this and it doesn't do that. But how much stuff did it do? I haven't heard, I haven't heard anything that has moved me that would another parameter that's going to move me <laughs> musically that will make a difference. Um, they might have made it tighter and more resolution and so forth, but that's only because that's only because they can do it now, or they they wanted to do it now, and um, and I hope that uh, with all of this this new. Um, technology that it yields more than just MIDI what MIDI point one <laughs> one point oh, um, um, uh, emit it um, uh, and if it does hopefully we can change the way that people think about each other Ned can you tell us um, how we can get hold of this movie right now what, what do people need to do where do they need to go okay if, if you're not in the United States proper then you get we now can go to four the number four bri dot com, and they will direct you to uh, a distributor that can get you the film. It's going to take take a few weeks, uh, and we're right now working on an international distributor so it can be much more efficient, obviously, so we can get the product out out to out to, out to Europe. Um, otherwise, you know, if you're in the United States, you can purchase it. Just go to the website, the Ballad of Don Lewis dot com, and right there on the portal page are for very valid options like Amazon, Target, places like that, where you can just click it, it goes right to the to the uh, ordering page, and you can you can pick it up, you know. And then of course there's yeah, there's vi video on demand. So if you happen to be in the United States and you're a cable TV subscriber, you can just uh, do a search for the Ballad of Don Lewis. It'll pop up, and you can just click it and watch it. So uh, this is at the early stages of distribution, but it's available. So yeah. Excellent. And I, yeah, highly recommend it. It's a great, great film. Gentlemen, it's been an absolute honor to, <laughs> to speak to you both. It's been so much fun. I wish we could do this more often and, and for longer. But uh, thank you ever so much for, for taking part. Great. Well, thank you for inviting yes. us, Rob. Thank you for listening. And be sure to check out the show notes page for this episode, where you'll find further information along with web links and details of all the other episodes. Before you go, make sure you visit the Sound on Sound podcast page at soundonsound.com forward slash podcasts, where you can explore all the other great content 
playing across the other channels. I'm Rob Puricelli, and this has been a failed Muso production for Sound on Sound.